Thanks, Michelle. We'd like to work closely with Florham Park because we have such, um, uh, particularly with the Janung family, um, we, uh, we, yeah, we, we can work together and, and um, you know, enjoy that very much. So what I'm going to do now, um, I'm going to introduce the entire program. There are actually four segments to it. And rather than stop and start and stop and start, I'll just give an overview of the whole program so you'll know what to expect. The, um, the first segment is, uh, we have a great, um, the great pleasure of having Marie Pascal Peretti. She's a professor of uh, French language at Drew University. And we'll begin our program with background information on France during the French Revolution and the war's impact on the population. And just to give a little bit of a bio, um, biographical background on her, she has her PhD in comparative literature from New York University. And she is the chair of the French and Italian department at Drew University presently. Um, she teaches 18th century um, literature and um, women's literature at Drew and has done some publications and is very interested in women's writing uh, from that early period in, in Europe. So, and then uh, after that, um, I don't know whether you've seen him or not, but many of you met Tom Janung when he was here for the program in the fall. And uh, wonderful personality and just um, so much genealogy uh, that he's, work that he's done. So he has come back all the way from Indiana and uh, to be here just for this program. And we're delighted to have him. He's gonna talk a little bit about challenges of genealogy and then a little bit about the Huguenot, um, Huguenots from France. And then moving on, um, following Tom will be Mark DiBiase from uh, Madison High School, uh, history department chair, who will guide his students through exp uh, explaining the research that they've done um, on some of the key French families who came to Bottle Hill and, have all, and also on a very famous visitor to uh, the French community here, Lafayette. I'd like to thank Kate Malcolm, Karen Jones, and Sue Simon for their help uh, with uh, you know, work with their students finding the resources at our local history center. And also I'd like to thank uh, Penny Shearer and her class at Madison High School for helping translate some of the Blanchette letters from French into English for the history students to use in their presentations. And following the student presentations, there'll be time for some questions and answers. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce Marie Pascal Peretti from Drew. Bonsoir à tous. Can you hear me? <laughs> Uh, first, I would like to thank Cathy Kultas, president of the Madison Historical Society, for inviting me to speak tonight. Uh, it's a very special event for me. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. I always thought I was the, French, the, the first French émigré in Madison. Little did I know that I merely, I'm merely a link in a long chain that extended back to the 17th century. Tonight, we will try to understand one particular facet of this long history of French immigration, specifically what attracted French émigrés to our region at the turn of the 19th century. Since I was asked to provide broad background to the study of the French uh, who emigrated to our region, I will talk first about the historical events that caused the French to flee France and its colonies. Second, I will examine the 18th and 19th century French perception and idea of America and how that helped shape the expectations of most immigrants, including those that made the smart decision to settle down here in beautiful Madison, then known as Bottle Hill. For this, I will rely on passages from travel accounts and influential French literary texts. The term émigré in, is the French word for emigrants, and usually refers to someone who has left his or her own country. When talking specifically about the French who immigrated to America at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, the term émigré has a double connotation. First, it refers to the individuals or families who left France for political reasons, to save their heads, so to speak. Second, it also refers to the fact that the French authorities considered their immigration an illegal act. But aside from these émigrés, our region also attracted refugees fleeing the French colonies located in what's part of the Lesser Antilles, Martinique, and Guadeloupe, and from the West Indies, specifically from Saint-Domingue, uh, which now corresponds to Haiti. Uh, of the French presence in North America prior to our period, 
what is probably best known in, is the exploration of Jacques Cartier and Samuel de Champlain, Champlain that ended up in the creation of New France in the first years of the 17th century. But at the same time, many French people came to America because of religious persecution in France. Elias Boudinot, a French Huguenot, whose family settled in Newark in the 17th century, is just one example among many reminding us that religion always played an important role in French immigration to North America at that time. In the 17th century, French colonial policy allowed only Catholics to emigrate, but most French Catholics were reluctant to leave their homeland. As a result, during this period, the people who came to North America from France were mostly explorers, traders, Jesuit missionaries seeking to convert the Indians, or Protestant Huguenots who fled religious persecution in France and came illegally to America. Um, Tom is going to talk a lot about the Huguenots, so I'm going to very briefly say a few words. But the Huguenots immigration peaked after uh, uh, King Louis XIV the, the revoked the Edict of Nantes in 1685, outlawing the Protestant religion and forcing the Huguenots to either convert to Catholicism or face death. The Huguenots who managed to leave often had to pay bribes or use connections to acquire false identity papers. As a result, the majority of the 15,000 15, Huguenots who arrived during the 17th century in North America were wealthy and skilled, and they eventually gained prominence as craftsmen and merchants. By contrast, most emigrants from the French Revolution era were Catholic, but of the greatest diversity in terms of their political, socioeconomic, and cultural backgrounds. What did they have in common, these royalists, republicans, masons, courtiers, artisans, priests and philosophers, slaves and free men? I'm asking you, what did they have in common? Exile. They, they all fled the revolution. Okay, they all fled the revolution. <coughs> and of course, they, were f they fled the guillotine. Although numbers are different depending on how one counts these émigrés, the figure of 25,000 seems to crop up and again in various sources as the total for those who took up residence in the fledgling United States at that time. As historian Alan Potofsky points out, the census of 1790 counted 5 million of men and women in the United States, excluding slaves and Native Americans. This meant that around 1% of the white population were emigres or refugees taking flight from the French metropole or colonies. 5,000 alone made their homes in the then capital of the United States, Philadelphia, meaning that in a city that numbered 28,500 in 1790, over one in six Philadelphians were French nationals. These waves of emigres fleeing France to come to the United States began in 1789 and persisted at least a decade. So why did the French flee France at the end of the 18th century? In her book, French Refugee Life in the United States, 1790 to 1800, Francis Childs shows that emigres from the French Revolution can be divided into two groups. The first, she tells us, was a voluntary immigration beginning in the summer of 1789. This consisted of members of the privileged classes, those perhaps least worthy of their privileges, who, scared by the fall of the Bastille, desire, uh, desired the full restoration of the old regime. Many of them emigrated to Germany. Uh, you may have heard of the Koblenz emigres, that was a large community in Germany. <coughs> 